I'm going to invite our first speaker uh, very shortly, but um, the IAGRI has actually come up with a very helpful video conference protocol um, which tells us how we should all behave in these meetings. And um, what I propose to do is that if people have questions as Marie Carmen talks, there is a chat function. If you um, see, hopefully at the bottom of your screen, there's a bubble that says chat. Um, and if you want to type in any questions that you have as Marie Carmen makes her presentation, then I will try and pick those all up at the end if I can, or if people just want to wait to the end of the presentation, um, that would be very helpful. If everybody could keep their microphones on mute, um, then we can back, um, get out the um, background noise. Um, so I think really, without further ado, Sarah, unless you have anything admin -y that you want to add to that? No, I'm fine with that. I think it's, it's all perfectly set up. Let's see how it goes. Okay, super, very good. Well, again, um, welcome everybody. Um, I'd particularly like to welcome our speaker tonight, my colleague, um, Dr. Marie Carmen Alama. Um, I'm delighted that she's here with us. Um, she has been incredibly patient. She is injured. Show us the extent of your injury, Marie Carmen. Oh, oh. dear. She has a, a, a very bad wrist injury, but despite that, she is uh, still willing to, to talk, as I say, to this momentous occasion. Um, Marie Carmen is a lecturer in post-harvest biology at Cranfield University's Soil and Agri-Food Institute. Uh, she has a PhD in food technology from the University of Valencia in Spain. Um, and she worked at the Agricultural Engineering Center at the Valencian Institute of Agricultural Research and at the Catholic University of Lerne in Belgium. Um, there she carried out work on an in-depth understanding of non-destructive post-harvest techniques, which I'm sure she will talk about later. And her specialisms are on things like internal food quality, and the mechanical behavior of fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, before she came to Cranfield, she worked as a food quality inspector, and she currently has projects working with the likes of people like the BBSRC and DEFRA, Unilever, Monsanto, Johnson Matthey, and PepsiCo. And she's actively involved in research and teaching, and I'm delighted to invite her and thank her very much for um, making this presentation. Uh, Marie Carmen, all over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jen, uh, Jane, and everybody. Um, I'm really happy that I've been invited for, for this meeting. Um, I think that what I was thinking is just to make an introduction of myself, but Jane has just done it for me, so that's great. Um, I've been uh, working um, at Cranfield, and I just leave this slide there, but uh, uh, you, you would know about it. So I've been working at Cranfield for 10 years now. Uh, if you look at my um, career background, uh, it, it's a bit of a mix of everything because I'm biologist by background, no plants whatsoever in terms of what my interests back then were. Uh, but then, uh, in spite of that, my PhD, I moved into um, uh, food science. And then uh, I had a mix of background with, in, with uh, uh, engineering and non-destructive techniques. But then when I came here at Cranfield, I just learned something new, which was more the physiology, uh, biochemistry of, of fresh produce. So I don't know. I know a bit of everything. Hopefully that would help me to make some sense of what I'm, my, my science is. Um, so when... Uh, when I was invited, I said, well, uh, just talk, Jane said, can you just talk about something, what you've done, what you are researching about? So then I, in the field of post-harvest uh, biology, we've got a number of projects and a number of interests. Uh, if we think about uh, how uh, the current uh, uh, growing uh, population is doing, uh, all the um, input that we need to put to provide uh, the population with secure nutritious food. Uh, many times the effort is put in the yield. So we, we need uh, more land, we need more production just to be able to feed uh, all, all this growing population. Uh, however, the, the, the nature provides with um, limited resources in terms of water, in terms of land. Uh, also the climate change is just playing a, a big effect on that. So kind of the approach that we are taking uh, from uh, 
from our uh, research perspective is just uh, what can we do once we have harvested any type of food to preserve it. So let's just remove some of the pressure from the environment and just try to uh, maybe reduce and put uh, loss and waste uh, just to provide with the food needed. Um, so in this, uh, in this sense is where I will just kind of base uh, my, my talk today. And I've just, I just normally like just to look at what are the challenges for the fresh uh, uh, produce supply chain. And, and here I've got uh, um, five of them, which uh, I think that they are, they are uh, relevant. So we've got the food loss and waste, as I was saying, uh, just uh, one, in some cases, one third of the uh, food that is being produced, uh, all that input in terms of, of uh, natural resources, uh, labor, economic uh, is lost. Uh, and then uh, what can we do just to reduce that uh, food loss and waste? Uh, another important aspect, and which is a challenge within the fresh supply uh, chain, is the quality and safety of the food that we have. So uh, there are many, or there are different techniques that we have, we use to preserve the, the, the fruit. So once it's harvested, you would store it at cold storage on different techniques. But the idea is just that we preserve the quality, but also the safety. So uh, the nutritional components, uh, uh, of the of the fresh produce, uh, they, they they have to be free of the spoilage and they have to be so uh, during the the shelf life. Uh, another aspect uh, it's uh, the market volatility. So when I I had to rescue some slides because today I couldn't do much. Uh, when I was putting these slides together, uh, I had in in mind that very very uh, hot summer that we had here not last year but the year before, I think. Uh, where the shelves at the retailers, they, they, they just com were completely empty uh, of salads because there was a really high demand uh, uh, of salads. And then there is a point where the, the market can't uh, cope with that. Uh, sometimes it's because the shelves are uh, empty, sometimes it's because the shelves are full, because for some reason the, the demand uh, decreases, uh, and then there is not enough demand, there is a surplus of products, uh, but if they are not stored properly, if we don't have the technology to do it, uh, then everything will end up in, in food waste. Another uh, uh, point very important as well is the use of chemicals. So uh, more and more uh, consumer and society, uh, we are pushing just to have uh, food which is free from chemicals. I will just uh, give here and later an example, which is uh, in, in, in the potato industry. Uh, it's very, uh, it has been very reliant on, on the use of CIPC as part of present and that uh, the limits have been, uh, have been uh, lower and lower all the time, but now has been banned. So we do need also solutions uh, just to replace those chemicals uh, when we are talking about um, storing and preserving uh, 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 fresh produce. And another um, challenge, um, a very important one is the packaging. So the packaging, plastic packaging, it's been used uh, to uh, preserve uh, the, uh, the, the food from external uh, conditions, uh, from uh, handling, from temperature, uh, water loss, and so on. So the purpose is good, and that will end up in a, a less uh, uh, food loss and waste. However, uh, the plastic, um, usage as such is also now we are trying to reduce it uh, it has also uh, environmental implications and uh, there are solutions that we will need to uh, investigate just to replace the commercial uh, plastic packaging as we understand it now so um, since i will be focusing my, my talk in reason uh, food loss and waste just to mention that uh, that is um, uh, one of the sustainable developmental goals. Uh, there is a lot of work and uh, research publications uh, around that topic. So we are just uh, within the post-harvest community. We are just uh, just now uh, putting together our uh, uh, strength and cooperation just to try to uh, minimize the food loss and waste, and then have a, a strong uh, post-harvest community which uh, can have the, the critical mass and the 
the capability to um, just steer and reduce uh, the wastage of, of food. Um, now, uh, just a brief uh, description where I come from. So, in in the uh, at Cranfield University, I'm in the uh, post harvest and technology uh, group at the Plant Science Laboratory. So, the aim of, of our research group uh, is just to develop technology for reducing waste, understanding storage life, shelf life of the produce, while preserving quality uh, and nutritional content. So there are different uh, um, areas of research where we worked. Uh, and I've just kind of listed uh, there. So we, we want to understand the post-harvest physiology and biochemistry. So which are the compounds that may change or may not change that uh, could also have nutritional uh, importance when we eat the, the food. Um, for that, we will investigate uh, the metamolomic uh, so all all the different um, compounds that are uh, and, and mechanisms and uh, pathways that are occurring during during uh, the storage uh, of the produce. Uh, we also uh, apply different technologies that could even uh, enhance the biochemical profile of of the food. Uh, we also work a lot on uh, packaging, and uh, I will give some examples of projects that we've been uh, uh, working on. And uh, now we are uh, more uh, working on the use of non-destructive techniques uh, for food quality assessment. So just put there some of the companies and organizations that we've been uh, working with, uh, there are many more, but uh, just to uh, give you an idea of, of the type of uh, people we are working with. So um, what I would do basically is I will just go through a number of case studies and examples of, of uh, projects that we are working on how we are trying to use uh, post-harvest technology to reduce uh, uh, food uh, waste and loss. Um, here I'm going to talk about a couple of projects where we've been using non-destructive uh, techniques uh, for that purpose. Uh, in this case, um, now it's uh, it's an European project, an interreg project that uh, currently is in the last year, uh, just about to finish. And this project is uh, trying to avoid food wastage uh, through interactive high technology sensor systems. So the challenge in the food industry uh, is uh, to, and for some of the uh, um, commodities, is to being able to store them for uh, a quite a long period of time. So we are talking about if uh, in this project, we, we've got uh, a big consortium uh, with uh, European universities and uh, companies together with uh, UK uh, ones. And uh, they are trying to um, study in commercial conditions, and that is the challenge, uh, whether we can monitor how the commodities uh, are, how are they behaving during storage, uh, just to see uh, if we can detect diseases or we can detect how a, a product is going through a senescence um, in order to take uh, informed decisions of, for example, when to uh, load or unload a, um, a cool room. So in these images down here, you will see uh, all these doors, they are big rooms uh, in these uh, uh, big boxes, uh, I think that they are uh, apples. So apples, uh, they can uh, they can be stored for five six months. Um, similarly, with potatoes, which is also a crop, which has been investigated in this um, in this project. So normally, uh, the stores will use low temperature, low light, and also modify environments in terms of uh, uh, the air composition, uh, kind of uh, lower uh, CO, um, high CO two, uh, and a lower oxygen, just to prolong the freshness of the produces. But these conditions are not ideal if we want to uh, uh, implement, in this case, sensors that are able to uh, tell us what the state of the produce is. So that is kind of the challenge from this uh, project, just to go from what has been done at lab scale to uh, um, industrial scale. Mm. So in this slide is just a, a bit of a summary of what uh, the project is about. So, uh, in store rooms, you have all these uh, pallets and boxes stacked one on top of each other. Um, uh, we 
uh, are investigating and looking at apples, pears, potatoes. And then um, while they are being stored, they will um, just produce a number of volatile compounds. Each of those volatile compounds can be related to a different process, biological process. So for example, there are ethylene and CO2, they can be related with the ripening stage of the product. Um, other compounds, so they are listing there, eth ethanol, ethyl acetate, et cetera, they are related to fermentation or the compounds to damage or to rotting. So the whole idea with this project is whether we can uh, implement sensors in those in big uh, storage room. Uh, all this information is being collected and then it's being analyzed. And um, when we develop a number of uh, uh, classification models or prediction models so that uh, they allow it allow us to identify when in a room there um, the, the profile of those volatiles is changing and if we can identify that uh, some specific volatiles are coming up and they are related with a uh, uh, rotin that means that uh, that camera uh, can we need to be opened and then the product need to go out uh, before uh, they develop further. So it's just to, to um, anticipate uh, and uh, it's based in the early detection of these um, biological processes uh, that uh, we are trying to, to have a tool uh, about. So this in this image, this is the prototype um, that has been developed in, uh, in Belgium. We've got this uh, prototype now in, at Cranford University. Uh, in one of our um, storerooms, and we are trying to identify. Um, we are working with uh, potatoes here in at Cranfield, and we are trying to identify by the study of the volatiles uh, when potatoes are um, starting to uh, get rotten, or when potatoes are um, trying to uh, start with what is called uh, in um, cold induced sweetening. So. To keep the potatoes for a long storage time, we reduce the temperature, but that has a, a, a negative effect on the um, sucrose content. And that's uh, the, the image that you can see down there, the, the, the crisps. Um, the sugar content is, is not very good for the processing industry. So that's why we are trying to prevent. So yes, this is a bit of a summary of what this project is about. Can we uh, develop a, a decision tool by which we can uh, uh, identify uh, uh, processes within the storage time before they can be uh, perceived by, by the eye, uh, before it's too late. Um, another project, and, uh, and in this case, that was an MSc student that was working with us last year, uh, where we have used the non-destructive techniques in, uh, uh, for the classification of, of um, Wheat seeds. Um, it's uh, it was funded uh, by a company. Uh, we've got that in the seed industry. Um, they are um, so they are just trying to develop new uh, varieties, uh, which would have a specific traits and desired traits. That is in terms of um, a yield, in terms of storability. Uh, any specific traits, there's a lot of uh, development in, in the industry and a lot of effort put for that. So most of uh, these uh, high um, or elite uh, varieties are hybrid. Uh, there is, in terms of the, and it's very difficult to identify uh, which lines are hybrid and which, uh, which seeds are hybrid and which line, uh, seeds are male. So there is, all of this is uh, being regulated by the Animal and Plant um, uh, Health Agency. And it's been um, established that 90, for, for someone to buy a seed, which is called hybrid, is because you would expect them to have uh, specific traits in it. They have to have 90% of the seeds in that lot need to be hybrid. So how can we uh, test that? So the traditional sorting methods that uh, they are normally used in the seed industry uh, have some drawbacks and uh, most of them are, uh, they, they are destructive. So you, didn't, you do need to uh, destruct uh, a subsample of a whole lot just to identify whether um, it complies with this 90% of purity. Uh, and then uh, the methods also used are, um, they're, normally expensive and time consuming if you have to do another 
kind of molecular analysis, for example, where you would be able to identify whether a seed is an hybrid or not. So uh, for that reason, uh, there is a demand for a, a, a cost-effective uh, sorted methods and uh, ideally non-destructive, so that uh, all the effort that has been put in the um, breeding program to come up with a new hybrid seed, uh, then it's paid off because uh, there is a way for the industry to sort them out and they are selling what the uh, customers are paying for. So with this uh, uh, background, uh, we did a, a project last year and we had some um, wheat seeds. Uh, once, uh, some of them were hybrids, some of them were male. So I don't know whether you will see it, but I just put those uh, two grades of, of seeds. Basically, by looking at them, it's very difficult to identify which one is one. So we took this approach where we were using two different uh, um, systems. One was visible near infrared spectroscopy, uh, uh, which is the image that you have at the top. And, and that uh, instrument worked in the range um, shown, so between 350 and 2005. And then on the other hand, we had a multispectral imaging system. In this case, um, it has 19 different wavelengths in the range shown there. So uh, we wanted to see whether any of these um, technologies could be used to uh, differentiate and classify hybrid from non-hybrid seeds. So uh, in the case of uh, uh, the Visni spectroscopy, what we have is just, if you can see in the image, we have a bulk um, sample. So we had some seeds that we put there and uh, with a probe, one of these uh, little wires that go there, the light will go, uh, will incite in the, in the sample and then it will be, the reflected light will be collected and and uh, process with the uh, equipment. So we end up with a spectrum, but uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, extract information out of there. So we need to use chemometric tools and with the objective of, of identify classification models. So I've just also shown some of the results so we can see, uh, we could see that the two uh, patches, the hybrid and the males were easily uh, uh, classified. Uh, after applying a number of pretreatment techniques, we uh, identified some wavelengths out of uh, those uh, hundreds uh, that you had in the spectrum, because we have to see that uh, within that range, the, from two, 350 to 2500, uh, we were taking um, one measurement every two or three nanometers. So out of those number of wavelengths, we could identify that around 15 wavelengths were the most important ones. That's why it's kind of highlighted there in that circle, that close up. And uh, when we apply different classification models, so uh, um, BLSDA or um, SMV, we uh, um, showed that we could identify the, the accuracy of the classification model was 100%. Um, so we were very pleased with that, but in this case, what we are looking is as a bulk, uh, bulk sample. So the challenge for industry and what they are looking at is whether we could identify a single um, seed, single kernels. That's what they are aiming at, and it's something that they are hoping that it could be implemented uh, in line. Um, then um, we also tried a, a, a multispectral imaging. In this case, we can have a 2D um, image of each of the cranes. We were looking at each crane individually. And again, following a similar approach where we were looking at different wavelengths and uh, using chemometric tools, we uh, were able, and that is the image that I've shown uh, uh, there with the kind of more red and blue uh, uh, kernels, uh, in this case, the classification model that we obtained was uh, had an accuracy of 97%. So uh, this is this work has now been submitted to biosystems engineering, uh, and is kind of a, a first step towards what uh, we are aiming at, which is a commercial uh, commercial tool. So at least this this proved that the, the potential of these uh, technologies. Uh, but now uh, 
there are more steps that need to be implemented uh, to be able to uh, develop uh, robust models because if you look at this that was done in one year with a, a batch of samples so one of the the critical things uh, in terms of these uh, non-destructive techniques and classification models is just to be able to have a very robust one so that you have one model and then you can feed uh, samples from different years and then you still have a very good accuracy in your model so uh, we need more validation steps we need uh, to include uh, more samples more uh, types of uh, varieties to to uh, finally identify whether this this model could be implemented in line and then of course uh, bring in um, engineering uh, side of it so that uh, the machinery uh, the hardware can be also implemented in, in the factory. Um, now uh, I'm, I will talk about more what is happening uh, inside of the product. So for us to be able to uh, implement technologies uh, in the post-harvest field in order to reduce food waste, we we have to have the technology but we do need to understand what is happening inside the crop and once we have that we understand the mechanisms behind uh, the different uh, biological processes then we could better implement a specific uh, technique so in this case i'm going to present a, a project that i've been uh, was working uh, for three years it was funded by the bpsrc and uh, it was about controlling the sprouting and um, uh, dormancy in uh, potatoes and onions. Um, this, uh, this slide basically is just to say that these two crops, uh, even though they are taxonomically uh, very different, uh, they are storage organs and uh, they have some similarities. Uh, commercially, they are uh, both uh, stored for a very long time. We, we are talking that it could be a store for five, six, seven months, even more. Uh, the, the numbers there, uh, they are related to uh, the, the amount of potatoes and onions that are currently um, stored uh, in the UK. And one of the major uh, main issues uh, that lead to uh, post-harvest uh, uh, waste in crops and on, in uh, sorry in tubers and onions is the dormancy break or sprouting or early sprouting so in this sense uh, because they are stored for a very long time uh, we need to be able to control that we need to to be able to reduce the sprouting or re delay the sprouting as much as possible so for that there are, there are several Te uh, techniques that are used uh, cold storage is, is the widest and probably the, the simple simplest one uh, but it has a uh, problem that is that if you store the potatoes in this case very low or too low uh, potatoes that are used for the processing industry will develop uh, reducing sugars so those reducing sugars what, ha what uh, will do is that when you uh, take the potatoes out of the storage and you process them just to make crisps when you um, subjected to high temperature when you fry them then they uh, they will uh, come out uh, more brown dark, that dark brown color so this is uh, this is not acceptable for uh, the industry there's also some uh, reactions that are produced there um, some uh, biochemical uh, chemical compounds that they are not desirable they are not they have a bitter taste uh, and we want to avoid that okay so then let's let's not use that uh, store them for that low temperature but then we need to use some chemicals if you if we want to control the sprouting uh, in potatoes and uh, the while uh, the, the chemical that is mostly used uh, is uh, the CIPC commercially known the chlorpropham and it's what I was mentioning at the beginning so the industry is really reliant on this it was really reliant on that because um, it has been banned uh, now so uh, this uh, coming season, potatoes won't be able to be uh, treated with CIPC, and therefore their industry has a real challenge to uh, uh, keeping the, the tubers uh, without uh, sprouting as they were doing it before. So, uh, in that sense, is where we are basing our um, big of our uh, research 
how we can control that uh, sprouting or dormancy. So we've done some work uh, um, for a number of years now. So we have used uh, um, UVC uh, radiation to treat the, the tubers. So we have also used ethylene, uh, one MCP. Here I'm just showing the results for uh, the, the when we were radiating with the ultraviolet um, light, and we um, we could see we, we found that when we were treating the tubers with the medium uh, dose of uh, UVC, then the sprout uh, length of the potatoes were reduced. So that's a potential technology that could be used. Uh, commercially, because it would be that before uh, potatoes are being stored, they can pass through a line where uh, a specific dose would be applied and therefore control dormancy. However, sometimes we find that there is very difficult that maybe with one single technology we can control everything and maybe we just need to overlay different uh, technologies just to obtain our objective. Um, another uh, area of research where we have uh, done quite a lot is the use of ethylene. So the ethylene supplementation uh, uh, has been proved that can uh, reduce sprouting and sprout length. Uh, in the image that I'm showing there, we've got a, a potato cultivar, Silvana, which, had, uh, which were uh, treated with a continuous ethylene uh, and then uh, all the way through our storage. Uh, we have the controls and when we had some of them which were treated with air, and only treated with ethylene at the first indication of sprouting. So that's the, the, at the right hand, right hand side, uh, you can see another image and that is uh, the little sprout. So when uh, you identify that 10% of the, the stored tubers were undergoing pipping, which is represented by that little sprout, then it's when ethylene was applied. And then the last image in the, in the first plate is when uh, they were storing ethylene and then uh, stopped and then coming in air and we we could see that the sprouts were even longer than the control ones so uh, ethylene is therefore a good technology uh, it allows us to uh, control uh, um, sprouting we uh, have identified that there is no need to use ethylene from the beginning of the storage we can manage when to apply it so we have uh, uh, two positive things. We are saving uh, energy and, and economic input in terms of not using that much ethylene. Um, but also the ethylene has a drawback, which is that when you use it for a long time, you can have an increase in reducing sugars, as it was the case when we were using the uh, low temperatures during the storage. So we, we have to find the balance of when uh, to introduce the uh, ethylene supplementation so that we can have the positive of uh, reducing sprouting and retarding dormancy break but uh, not having that high increase in reducing sugars. So all of these are papers that have been published uh, within the group uh, and this kind of sits the, the crown of, of, uh, of the, the, this project that I would like to uh, talk about now. So uh, the one that was funded by the BBSRC. So, okay, we do know, we have some technologies that we can use. We, we, we understand and we can see that they, they, they are good to prevent uh, dormancy and sprouting. But what we want to know is just to understand the mechanisms behind that. So we, we don't uh, have enough by just doing some empirical work. We need to understand why that is happening and um, and for that reason, we created this consortium with different uh, universities and uh, research institutes. It was, it was led by the James Hutton Institute in Scotland. And then we had Imperial College, uh, University of Greenwich and ourselves, and then a number of companies. So in this um, project, what we wanted to, to just to link and un was the, 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 wanted to understand was the interplay of uh, the physiology uh, of the sprouting and uh, dormancy break and how uh, that was regulated. So we, we know and we've seen that respiration rate and ethylene production uh, can be changing uh, during the storage. Uh, we wanted to also uh, study the, the relationship with the, the sugars but also with the, the plant growth regulators. So we know that uh, ABA 
and cytokines are key uh, hormones in the dormancy process. Uh, the dormancy uh, uh, process is, is uh, can be different with, uh, if we are talking about seeds, if we're talking about tubers. Uh, so the, the role of these hormones is, is uh, very wide and could be distinct from one process to another. So within this project, we want to fully understand what is the role of the ABA and metabolites and the cytokinins. Cytokinins are uh, hormones that are um, uh, responsible for the division of the cells, why ABA is known to be a prerequisite for dormancy. So uh, when ABA is high, the dormancy state is uh, maintained, but when it decreases, then uh, the dormancy uh, breaks. Uh, and then with this in mind, we wanted to see which are the genes that are controlling this process of dormancy break. So for that, we were looking at, uh, studied the RNA uh, of the, um, in both potatoes and onions. Uh, we did an RNA sequencing and we wanted to just uh, identify uh, key uh, dormancy related genes that would probably potentially help us to uh, come with new uh, cultivars or new ways uh, that the breeding process could be approached. Uh, for that, we were using a mapping population, so uh, with no uh, parents, so that we can have a clear understanding of uh, uh, lines which were short dormant or uh, long dormant. And then what we were doing was phenotype uh, the process of dormancy break. So if you can see the image there, we were just looking at uh, the apical cluster, but where all the, the sprouts will come through originally. And then we were just uh, phenotyping and dividing uh, the status of dormancy, just uh, being when it's dormant, when it's eye movement, uh, when it's sprouted and so on. So we did these throughout storage during two years. And then uh, in these images, you can see uh, what we were sampling. So we took that um, apical bud, we were just phenotyping and counting uh, and sampling these uh, metastomatic tissue where this product was coming out. And then from that uh, tissue, we were uh, looking at the biochemistry. We were looking at which hormones uh, were there and how the different profile was going through our storage. So here is just a, uh, um, an example of what uh, we were looking at. So here we have, for example, those potatoes that had uh, long dormancy so that they, they, they lasted longer in storage without being uh, had in sprouts. And we could see that the uh, ABA concentration, ABA related hormones was higher. Uh, and then in the case of uh, ABA catabolites was the other way around. So the high dormancy had a uh, lower cat uh, catabolites. So this gives us an, an idea and a proof of what is the process going behind that. And then in exactly the same samples, we uh, performed an RNA uh, seq. So uh, based on this information, we were able just to see what which were the differential expressed genes between high and uh, low dormancy uh, lines um, during those two years of experiment. This work is not published yet, it's not finished, uh, but at least it gave us uh, the, the, the ground again of, of what we would like to go for. So the next, uh, the impact on the future steps, uh, steps in this research is like, okay, can we breed new cultivars but have a, some of these genes enhanced? And we, once we know the genes, uh, we can just understand, well, let's breed against those and then have cultivars that intrinsically they have longer dormancy and therefore we can just not rely on the chemical uh, 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 chemicals that being applied and explosive suppressants. Um, also uh, that with, with the emerging technologies uh, we could if we identify biomarkers during this study of the hormones or as sugars that has been uh, done if we identify those biomarkers, they would be, we can choose uh, quick techniques based on antibody uh, or gene expression monitoring that have been used norm currently for apple storage. And we can use that and exploit them in, in, in terms of uh, easy kits. Uh, 
just to to discriminate discriminate whether one uh, cultivar it's it's a higher or low dormant. So again, this is a, a bit uh, looking forward uh, in, in in what next step would be. But this is uh, why uh, we are just going into our research and looking at not only the technologies that we can use, but also the uh, the mechanisms behind. Uh, the use of that uh, technology or mechanism behind the biological processes. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, now I will just give uh, two or three more examples of, of projects within the, the post harvest uh, remit that we are working um, and for which we we are uh, developing technology. So in this case, uh, this project uh, was funded by uh, Innovate UK and BBSRC, and it's about uh, packaging. So I've mentioned at the beginning of, of the, my talk that one of the um, main challenges that has the supply, food supply chain nowadays is the production of uh, plastic packaging. Uh, in this project, uh, we were trying to identify new uh, innovative uh, packaging uh, to preserve the quality and the nutritional content of the fruit. So uh, it seemed that it could be the same nutritional content and quality. So quality, we normally tend to talk about quality when the, the product that we are uh, talking about, it keeps the color, keep the firmness, so parameters and attributes that the consu both consumers and industry are looking for. So we want that our apples and our tomatoes don't lose weight. Uh, they, 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 they are still in the good appearance because that would be at the end of the day how we will uh, base our purchase on. However, there are also some other attributes which are the nutritional content. We want them to look good, but we also need them to be still uh, nutritious. Uh, so the vitamins and other compounds like antioxidants that they are not uh, depleted during the storage and we want uh, that they keep uh, maintain the flavor. So that is uh, what we are talking about in nutritional composition. So we know that in terms of packaging, uh, we package the fruit or the vegetables, uh, but the packaging is static. So the fruit would be ripening or the uh, vegetable will be senescent uh, during the, the, the time that they are under the packaging. And what we need to have is a, a, a a packaging that could handle those changes that happen into the fruit. So well, day one, uh, if we put some strawberries, they will have in one um, physiological state, they won't respire the same, they won't produce the same volatiles as in at day three. So we uh, are aiming at packaging that can cope with that. In that sense, I'm just giving here some examples of uh, work that was done with blueberries, where we were monitoring the respiration, so the CO2 production of those uh, uh, blueberries when they were stored at different uh, uh, environment conditions. So when, uh, when they were stored at in air or when they were stored at the optimum uh, modified atmosphere, so the optimum percentage of CO2 and oxygen, uh, and then also different gradients. So when we have that optimum, we can apply, reach that optimum in one, I mean, immediately, or we can reach that optimum in three or seven days, which I think that is it, it, it was represented in the images. We could see that the uh, uh, gradient control atmosphere seven, so it took seven days to reach that. Uh, we saw in two consecutive years that the respiration rate was reduced. That means that the metabolism is reduced, and that means that we are expecting the fruit to long uh, and keep uh, in good condition for a longer time. And uh, that can be also seen in the decay incidence. So we could see that with those, uh, with that treatment, the, the uh, fruit that were uh, uh, deceased were uh, lower. Uh, another example, uh, it's the, uh, another project uh, where we uh, wanted to uh, implement a, a non-destructive techniques, innovative photonics techniques, to uh, identify the flavor life of UK grown apples. So apples, again, as I was saying before, they can be stored for a long period of time, num a number of months, and uh, once they're harvested, they are stored, and then during that time, uh, they can uh, reduce their quality. 
we want it and, um, and uh, in a, with a similar concept with that interact project we were just trying to use we were uh, photonics so non-destructive techniques that will be able to identify uh, the the flavor life so the quality of the apple based on uh, volatiles and based on uh, internal composition of uh, antioxidants so uh, again we were just uh, developing models to uh, as a, as a um, decision support tool to see when uh, different uh, uh, consignments of apples uh, could, I mean, we're reaching the end of uh, flavor life, and therefore the companies, the the packing houses, could just manage their stock in those very very big storage uh, rooms. And they said, well, if this lot is now reaching the end of the flavor life, because we were monitoring and correlating the the volatiles, the flavor of the, uh, the apples with some specific uh, uh, profile with the photonics. That let's just take them out of the storage and then put them in the market before another room. Um, and then to finish, and uh, similarly, uh, we've been working with a, a poultry farms on uh, asparagus for a number of years now. And here we were also studying how, uh, by using dynamically controlled atmosphere, we could preserve the, the storage life of uh, um, asparagus peers. So we know that they have a very short window, relatively short window of uh, uh, harvesting, and uh, it's very difficult to cope with a demand. Uh, and most importantly, again, I'm mentioning that very hot summer a couple of years ago, there was so much production that uh, the, the, the asparagus without a suitable technique that can keep them for at least two or three weeks in storage, uh, being able to maintain the, the, the quality, all those spheres will be left in the field uh, once all the input has been put on the effort uh, cultivating them and all of that will be a, a production that will be wasted so just here an example of, of the, um, the work that has been done and papers that uh, are being published um, in relation to that so i think that uh, this is all what i had to say uh, if you have any questions please do ask uh, that was a, a summary in a nutshell about what we uh, are doing at Cranfield uh, related to post harvest. So, uh, questions more than welcome. Thank you, Marika, very, very much. A fascinating, gosh, when we go into a supermarket, whatever, fascinating talk um, of what goes on behind the scenes. Um, I have one question uh, from, oh no, two questions from. Uh, Tim Chayman, would you like to ask your question, Tim? Uh, you need to take your mute. Yeah. Tim, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I I, un, I videoed myself, but didn't unmute. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I got three questions actually. Well, um, well let, let's see. I may. <laughs> of course. Um, starting from when you were talking about um sensors in stores to detect yes. changes in the in the ha, are you able to determine when it's you need to actually go to the store and do something because it, it it's the the amount of deterioration you might have to go into the store and find something that's well hidden so how mm -hmm. do you can you differentiate well at the yeah at this point um if that is uh, related to that interact project that we had at this point what we uh, were aiming is at identifying uh, probably areas within the um, storage room so these rooms are uh, very big and the idea would be to uh, put different sensors in different areas of the room all these oh, sensors right, right. will be feeding yeah. and then uh, We'll be feeding the the, the, the the computer and then the model that you would have developed previously would be able to tell you whether i will see it as a like hot spot so it, if it's a high risk a medium risk of of being in, in this uh, disease or ripening uh, too much or something like that uh, but uh, at this point that would be about it so 
imagine you've got a, a pile of, of uh, crates or something is true so the problem would be maybe would be maybe in one of the boxes uh, but at this point I think that is more just identifying areas within specific rooms uh, that's where I see it happening right so it's a matter of having enough sensors really to make sure you're monitoring the whole of the crop and can yes. identify areas yeah yes yeah. and and the thing is that sometimes uh depending on on which crop so for example uh if we are looking at uh storage of apples um and when we are looking at they being stored under control atmosphere these rooms are sealed so that means that right. by by your historic data, you know that uh, apples will last for, in this condition, will last very good for three or four months or whatever. So you just go with that. And that means that when you, because opening the room means just changing the atmosphere of yeah, yeah. that how many tons uh, room. So, yeah, so you don't, you don't want to open it unless you absolutely have to. Exactly. So at least, I mean, at least you have some evidence that something may be going wrong. So that's why it's kind of a decision support tool. So if I can have some input on among me, my five or six rooms I've got, and it, it would give me a room just to, to manage better my, my crop. Right, right, thank you. Are, are there any other questions, Jane, or can I go on from my, my other two? Um, <laughs> nobody else has sent me anything via chat. Um... Oh right. yes, big you, you, one. Alan, Alan has. Um, okay, no. Uh, go on, Tim. You carry on. Yeah. I don't think anybody um, else has sent me any chat. But if anybody else right. has a question, if you want to raise your hand or, or send, send something via <laughs> chat, yeah, function, yeah you have to press. You have to press. I found that with the chat, you you've got to enter the pre the you've got to press the enter key for it to go. I couldn't. I didn't know how to get it to go initially. But anyway, it's gone. Um. Yeah. The other one Very was good. about potatoes. If if <laughs> you could maintain dormancy in potatoes permanently how long would they actually store for but uh, presumably they rot from other reasons yeah so the thing is that um i so the, the dormancy is something that i don't see just uh being prolonged forever but it would it would depend on which the usage of of it. So, for example, for a uh, processing industry, one of the main issues is the uh, the sugar content. Uh, so, the resistant sugar. So, if you can have a, a variety which uh, naturally has a longer dormancy, that would mean that you wouldn't need to store them at that low temperature. So, therefore, you won't have those sugars increasing, and therefore, you would be able to keep it longer. At the same time, you also have to look at the water loss, which is probably from the industry perspective, one of the key issues because uh, you put one tone and when you take them out, you have 10% less. Right, right. So, yes. so it's, it's, it's just looking at everything. I, I mean, the thing is that when we are, when we are doing research, of, of course, we're focusing on one specific aspect. Yes. So if, if we forget about everything else we will say okay if they are not sprouting then let's keep them from one season to another in very good conditions which is basically right. what's happening now but uh that is with the detriment of other attributes that we would like also to manage yeah and on, on that about apples is, yes. is there a trade-off between um uh keeping uh, where is it trade off between flavor and texture. So you, you might better maintain the flavor, but actually the texture of the apple changes to an unacceptable yes. level. Yes, so I, the, the trade off is that as it is now, there are limits and thresholds for firmness in terms of industry uh, parameters. So that is something that you need to meet. Right. Uh, and then the challenge is just to, to keep that firmness and then maintain the flavor. So what normally happens is that uh, you, you may end up reducing volatiles and therefore you will end up having uh, apples which are quite dull, so they are not as tasty. Um, mm. 
and and that is uh, again kind of the approach that we had in this uh, in this uh, project was okay. Let's see because not all apples, not all batches uh, will behave the same. Uh, yeah. Let's try to identify okay which ones. So when we identify that there are volatiles uh, coming up, if that is a biomarker, and that is representative of just uh, going senescent uh, or over ripened, then just before to, before it's just too late, just manage that store and put it out. Or if there are volatiles that are being reduced too much, so if we, we identify specific volatiles which are related with a, a typical uh, flavor, apple flavor, we don't want them to just go too low. Right. So, uh, but the question about the trade-off, the trade-off is that we, we do need to meet the specification for firmness, uh, at least how it is now in the industry. And, uh, and then we are just trying to, to manage and, and get that flavor still as good as possible during storage. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Well. Excellent. I think we have a question now from John Stafford. John, and then Martin. It's a good job that Tim said you had to press the enter key. I put my question in half an hour ago. Um, yeah, on um, on monitoring um, fruit and, and produce in sealed stores by mm -hmm. spectroscopy, yes. um, isn't it too late by the time the compound or gas is detected because the fruit already is starting to rot? With the, the spectroscopy, um, the, the idea, so for example, what we were showing with the seeds and uh, um, the, the idea is just to use it at the, it can be used at different points. So at point of uh, going into the store so that you could identify different uh, grades. So if we are looking at uh, ripening, if you can identify a uh, unripe and medium and unripe and then you can already diverse the fruit to where they would be stored and in which conditions uh, is if it's in terms of a um, for example there are crops like uh, uh, citrus or other um, or even strawberries that when you take them uh, they don't have any apparent uh, problem but the idea is to have these systems in line. So and that's again the challenge. So normally when we do things in the lab, if we are lucky, we have very good results. But then we have to, if we want it to, to, to be commercially uh, in use, we have to just make it at the speed that uh, a factory will operate. So in this case, it's like, okay, we by the normal uh, RGB uh, cameras that are uh, always normally used in, in the factories, you can identify rotten from not rotten, but some of them have already uh, pre-symptoms that cannot be picked up. And the idea is that you pick them up before you pack them or before you pre-pack them and store them and you wait. So you can take decisions at that point and therefore you are better uh, making use of, of the crop that you have and you will uh, waste less. Okay. Well, so what what is the sort of minimum detection level? I mean, how 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 rotten does, does an apple have to be, or whatever, before so, you can detect it? For example, uh, we've uh, I've I've done in when I was working in uh, in in the Spanish Institute, they've they've been working and they are uh, detecting uh, probably a a rotten uh, orange like a week. Or a week and a half before it can be visually detected. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something like. That. Mm -hmm. Of course, it would depend on on the shelf life of the product. So with a with a strawberry, if you can detect a panet or strawberries that uh, already have symptoms of of uh, disease one day in advance, that would be enough. Mm -hmm. Because obviously in the shelf life it would be four or five days and that would be it. So we we'll depend on, on the crop. Okay, thank you. thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we have a question from Martin and then after that Paul Miller. So Martin. 
Oh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for a very uh, interesting presentation. Thank um, you. My, my question is about uh, the dormancy period. Um, yeah. I'm sort of interested to sort of understand whether you can model that in terms of, if you like, the growing practices that have resulted in your particular crop. Okay, so uh, I couldn't hear you. So your question is about whether we could model the time uh, to dormancy? That's, that's well, whether the, the dormancy time could be predicted based on, should we say, the growing history of that particular um, crop. Okay, so um, in principle, I think that it could be done. We haven't uh, worked on that specifically, uh, but we, we've done uh, some research with a um, onions, again in dormancy, where we are looking not only at the post-harvest uh, conditions or treatments that we could apply, but also how the pre-harvest conditions would affect the dormancy uh, later on. So um, how I see it is that by uh, collecting, collecting information on uh, different pre-harvest factors, let's say soil, it could be, uh, I don't know, weather conditions, something, so parameters there. And then uh, if you just monitor also how uh, the dormancy is progressed, you could perfectly have a model where you would include both pre-harvest and post-harvest uh, variables to, to be able to model that. We haven't done it ourselves. Right. But but that but that is something that we are more and more interested in because we understand that looking only at pot harvest is is not good enough because we are meeting so many factors. So the, in this case, the dormancy, but also the quality of a crop, is determined at the time of harvest. All what you can do afterwards is preserve it. Sure. So so we we do need the input from from pre harvest. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next, um, Paul Miller has a question. Uh, I, uh, thank you. I, I'm interested in the relationship between what happens in the field and what happens when you get to the stored crop. And so I've got two questions relating to that. Firstly, is there a, a relationship? Obviously, with potatoes, spraying in the field with malic hydrazide yes. was an alternative to CIPC in, in olden days. Yes. Um, and so therefore what you put on the crop in the field makes a difference to how it's going to behave in the store. Yes. So how do you tackle that? And secondly, who's, who, who has the regulatory responsibility? Because if you go and spray things on a crop, then that's very heavily regulated and very strongly monitored. Mm -hmm. What happens? Who, who regulates what you put on the stuff or how you treat stored produce? So, uh, for example, the, the CAPC, there was this uh, CAPC stewardship uh, uh, organism that was regulating that. So everything is regulated. The use of ethylene is also regulated. Uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you who is the organism who does that, but it's regulated. Um, uh, the, the CAPC that it used, which was used in post-harvest, has been the, the maximum level of residues has been decreasing over the years uh, more and more and more and, until we, we kind of, we were, to be honest, what we thought that it would happen last year was that the level probably would be so low that it will make it very difficult to manage it commercially. But they did the completely the last uh, step and they just directly ban it. So uh, there, there, there is a specific regulation, but and each um, chemical would be regulated by someone specifically. But I cannot tell you, for example, the ethylene who regulates that. Ethylene is a hormone, a naturally uh, occurring hormone, and also is being used. There is a commercial. Uh, brand restraint that uh, just commercializes the application of the ethylene uh, in the storage. That was one question. And the other question was, ah, the, the, the pre-harvest, the use of pre. 
I don't know oh, whether I've responded to your questions or not. I don't know if I've responded. All I was interested in is, is there, is, is the, re the relationship between what happens and how you treat the crop before it's harvested, mm -hmm. how much does that influence what you have to do after it's harvested? Well, it influences it a lot, massively. So, for example, when it's kind of additive effects. So if you control dormancy pre-harvest, uh, so malic hydroxide is being used, uh, yeah. then that kind of just sets a line and then that would mean that maybe you don't need that much chemical used in post-harvest. However, is whether uh, that would be also uh, restricted, the use of malic hydroxide or not. So now with the ban of CIPC, that is, has come again more. For example, all our research, we do it on crop, which has not been uh, treated pre-harvest. We are just looking at purely uh, uh, untreated crops so that we are in the worst case scenario and we are just trying to understand uh, what is happening and how ethylene is affecting uh, dormancy or, or, or which genes are being uh, changed or switched on and off in the absence on, of any other treatment. But definitely, it does have a massive effect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from anybody? I, I, nobody else has sent me another chat. So is there anybody else that has any questions for Marie Carmen? Can't see anybody that's making a noise or <laughs> actions or anything. So, um, so I assume not. Um, By the time we turned our, turned our sound on again, Jane, then we could inundate you with voices. <laughs> oh, please do. By all means. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I'd just uh, like to thank Marie Cummins very much indeed for a fascinating um, discussion, fascinating presentation, um, fantastic um, visuals and graphics which were very very attractive and, and and made the talk really really interesting and thank you especially as i know you are suffering so um an excellent talk um so i think i don't know what the protocol is for thank laws and hopefully you can hear us, but anyway, thank yes, you indeed. very much thank well you done. very much very good. <laughs> thank you thank you it's, it's been great so that was my first time doing a virtual uh -huh. seminar and uh, and I enjoyed it so thank well, you very much and thank you for all the questions thank you okay thank